Welcome everybody. And uh, thank you for coming to our second uh, of, in a series. It's called the uh, uh, Sight and Sound Bites from the Ioneer Foundation. This is our new bi-weekly uh, lunchtime educational webinar series of research and clinical innovations at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. I'm Lawton Snyder, and I'm the CEO of the Ioneer Foundation. We support research to advance care for vision, hearing, balance, voice, cancers of the head and neck. Uh, we work closely with the two world-renowned departments of ophthalmology and otolaryngology at the University of Pittsburgh. The majority of the funds we provide are supported by philanthropic donations. Um, and uh, thank you for those of you who are uh, getting this invitation because you are donors. Before I make the introductions for today's speakers, I need to go over a few housekeeping items. This is uh, a Zoom product, but it's, it's a webinar Zoom product. It looks very much like Zoom and we're all getting pretty familiar with how to use Zoom these days. But for the webinar, um, for today's webinar, here's what you won't be able to do, which you may be familiar with. The chat feature for this webinar is disabled, so please don't um, try to use the chat feature. But the question and answer, the Q&A feature, the little bubble on the bottom of your screen, if you, if you hover your mouse over the bottom of the screen, you'll see the Q&A bubble. You can click on the Q&A bubble and ask questions, type them in at any time during the presentation. And uh, I will tell you that we're gonna hold all questions or hold all answers to your questions until the very end of the presentation. And, uh, but I will be reading those questions as they come through for our panelists to answer. We also have a feature where you can raise your hand. And that's also, that's available on your, uh, on your bar at the bottom. Um, if you'd rather not type in your question, you can raise your hand and uh, we will unmute you when I see your hand raised so you can ask your question with your microphone. Um, tomorrow, you'll receive a survey via email to provide us with feedback on today's webinar. We appreciate that. Uh, you'll also be added to our email list to receive future webinars uh, information that we will be providing again for our bi-weekly series. Today's sound, Sight and Sound Bites, the topics will include tinnitus, hearing loss, drug discovery, hearing, and behavior. And um, our presenters are Dr. Thanos Zanopoulos. Dr. Zanopoulos is Professor and Vice Chair of Research at the Department of Otolaryngology. He's UPMC Endowed Professor of Auditory Physiology. He's the Director of Pittsburgh Hearing Research Center at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Uh, he is gonna be joined by Dr. Ross Williamson, who is an assistant professor at Department of, Op of Otolaryngology and Neurobiology, and also with the Pittsburgh Hearing Research Center at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. And then during the panel discussion, uh, we're gonna ask Dr. Catherine Palmer to join as well to help with the questions and answers. Dr. Palmer is associate professor, Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders and Otolaryngology. Dr. Palmer is, a, is an associate professor in communication science, uh, uh, sorry, serves as director of audiology and hearing aids at the <clears throat> University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, including UPMC Children's Hospital. So um, uh, I'll uh, turn this over now to Dr. Sinopoulos. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me well? Lonnie, is it good, the sound? Yes, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, Lonnie, thank you very much for the introduction. So today we're going to talk about uh, um, hearing research that goes on here in, uh, here in Pittsburgh. And this uh, overall effort to address uh, hearing research and hearing loss related uh, issues is uh, happening under the umbrella of the Pittsburgh Hearing Research Center, which consists of a group of uh, committed uh, clinicians and researchers trying to understand hearing and uh, hearing loss from very basic mechanisms to, uh, <clears throat> to more clinical work. And uh, this is today, we're going to talk mostly about uh, the brain aspects of hearing. As you probably know, we hear with our ears, but a big part of hearing is happening with our brains and that will become uh, more obvious later as I'm talking. And both uh, myself and Dr. Williamson we're going to talk about uh, different aspects of uh, brain-related hearing during normal and pathological processing, auditory processing. In our case, we're going to talk about uh, 
about tinnitus. So I chose to speak about tinnitus because this is a project that uh, we've been uh, working on for 10 years and it shows the multidisciplinary approach from a basic mechanism to drug development and hopefully bringing the potential drugs to the market. And probably most of you know what tinnitus is. Tinnitus is the, this ringing in the ear. It's a phantom perception of sound in the absence of an external stimulus. Um, we say ringing in the ear, but this can be a very annoying and, a, and at times a tremendous uh, uh, condition. There are approximately 50 million Americans that experience it. And about five to 10% of them, about 5 million are debilitated by it. They cannot concentrate, they cannot sleep, and they, they're very bothered by it. And um, what, uh, <clears throat> and also in, uh, in the, um, it's a not number one uh, service related disability for, uh, in the Department of Defense. And uh, frankly, a lot of suffering of individuals and a lot of financial uh, burden is associated with tinnitus. And although there are several therapies, and Dr. Palmer can talk more about it, but if I have to say briefly, there is uh, sound therapy, including also <clears throat> cochlear implants and also counseling. So it's these two, three different things that can help alleviate the symptoms, but there is not yet any cure and there is not any FDA drug approved. So we started studying this uh, about uh, 10 years ago. And soon I'm going to tell you what the specific progress that, that we've done. But before getting into the, into the practical and detailed things, I would like to give a, what, what is our general thinking about how, how tinnitus is, uh, is happening. So as I said earlier, tinnitus is a phantom perception, right? Phantom perception is, is not a bad thing by definition. And uh, we all have phantom perceptions. And uh, actually, as it was argued uh, 2,500 years ago by Aristotle, basically the phantom constructs are at the core of cognition and mindfulness, right? If we don't, our mindfulness and our consciousness depend on our ability to create images, either auditory or visual images, and which means that our brain is constantly creating sounds and, uh, and visions and uh, tactile stimuli in, in our brain trying, to, trying to, to understand the world. So why then, why do we have phantom perception? And thinking itself, right, is, is a phantom perception. Why do we have ph phantom perception? I think what I think, and a lot of other neuroscientists may, might agree with it, is that um, it has to do with the fundamental, uh, fundamental job that the brain has to, to perform, right? So the, the, the brain performs an online prediction of reality, and this prediction has to have the same speed as reality, and it cannot go either behind or it can go faster. It has to match reality dynamically, and I will, I look, I will explain that. And that's why you need this, uh, this final perceptions. For example, you see a car, right? You, you know, it's a green light, you want to cross, but then you see a car coming towards you and they don't stop, right? So then you make all these predictions, right? How close he or she is, how fast they're going. And these are, but your brain is keeping working and it's not just taking the input, right? But it's creating, it's creating its own image of reality. So you can understand that if this image of reality <laughs> lags behind, you know, you're not going to move and then uh, you're going to go where dinosaurs go, right? You, you go, you're going to not exist for too long. On the other hand, if, you're, if the matching of reality is uh, faster than actually what, the, what reality does, you'll keep jumping here and there without any purpose and sooner or later again, probably you, you're, not, you're not going to survive. So I think that the, the brain is constantly working, trying to predict the external world and match it also with the internal world and state. So although our senses feed us <laughs> with our sensory stimuli, I want to make clear that our brain's constantly creating an internal representation of the world. And that's for survival, and I said, but sometimes it's not just for survival, right? A few days ago, I was listening to uh, the Alpine Symphony by Strauss, this is just complete sound, right? And it's a great symphony. I heavily recommend that you hear it if you haven't. So basically it describes in his symphony, uh, a day in the mountain, right? He starts in the morning. So I could really see the mountain. I could see the sunset in the mountain. And that was without any visual, any visual stimuli, right? It's all auditory. So 
These final perceptions allow us to survive because it helps our brain hard work, but it's all, they're also crucial for our well-being and uh, for our entertainment, if you will. So evolution has created these internal generated representations of basic aspects of the outside world. So, and this, this is a good thing, but I suggest that uh, sometimes when things go wrong, these uh, internal, internally representation sound uh, perceptions can be released due to some problem. So what, what could be that be released? And I mean, being, being uh, conscious, we are becoming conscious now of this uh, internal representation when we don't want to. We think that something like, something like that happens in tinnitus and in most of cases tinnitus is associated with hearing loss and so we think that due to peripheral, to peripheral damage and due to hearing loss the input that goes to the brain now is not very well matched so the brain is trying to compensate or is trying to change its strategy and during this change it can create this uh this false perception of sound which is uh the phantom percept as we said Okay, so what, what have we done now? This was a general idea and rather philosophical. It, it can be practical too, as you're going to see soon. The question is, okay, what can we do to understand what happens with tinnitus and this false perception of sound that can become uh, annoying and can uh, reduce the quality of our life? And what can we do about it? Now I'm going to put a slide here. Let me show. Can you see it? All right, can, and um, here is what we have done about tinnitus. Now, we knew this project started about 10, 11 years ago, and that was in uh, 2009 when I first came here. And before I start describing you in the next three, four minutes what we have done, None of this work would have been done first without uh, Peter Whip, who's a collaborator, as you can see, he was very uh, important for generating the, the compounds and potential drugs that I'm going to talk to you about soon. And then, of course, that was a huge support by- Excuse me, Thanos, just a yes. second. Uh, if you would do the, um, uh, the, the share, um, you have the share screen and we can see that, but can you also start the presentation so, so it gets a little larger? We have oh, I see. Yeah, thank you. Oh, is it better? Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Um, I was saying all of this work uh, has been a collaborative work and it's going since 2009. And uh, it involves uh, Peter Whip, who is a chemist and has created these uh, uh, small molecules that are potential drugs. And then um, <clears throat> this has been with support from uh, Dr. Jonas Johnson, the chair of the uh, uh, Department of Otolaryngology, support from crucial support from the INEAR Foundation which has supported me through all these uh, stages. And also for this project has been supported from the Department of Defense and National Institute of Health. And all this work that I'm going to describe today was done by several students and postdocs in my lab. It will be hard to mention them now. So, okay, before I was started, it was known that humans that uh, suffer from tinnitus, parts of their brain, parts of the auditory brain are hyperactive. There is activity there that is not, that is more than normal, if you will, right? They start, these neurons start firing when there, is, then there was not an external stimulus, suggesting that this might be at the core of what happens, uh, what happens with the pathology of tinnitus. So in order to study the mechanism, we want to have an animal model of tinnitus. So we created an animal model and we could know if mice had tinnitus or not. We can discuss that later in the questions, how, how we determine that. And then in 2011, we determined that previous, previous work has shown that uh, when mice were awake that the, this part of the brain that's called the dorsal cochlear nucleus, this part of the brain is the very first stop of the auditory nerve. When the auditory nerve goes to our brain, it goes to this area. Again, this area was hyperactive, there was more activity. And we're able to reproduce that in brain slices from, uh, from mice and study the mechanism. So the first question became, why do these neurons in this part of the brain fire more in mice that have behavioral evidence of tinnitus just the basic, the basic mechanism of this hyperactivity. So then what we found is that these neurons have a problem in a potassium channel. What is potassium channel? I'm going to explain briefly. So neurons are, you know, the currency of neurons, the way neurons communicate, they, they communicate with electrical signals, right? So there are 
excitatory inhibitory forces onto neurons that tell them to, to fight, to become active or to stop from being active. And there are, and this, this, this excitatory inhibitory force, if you will, can be what other neurons tell to other neurons. There can be synaptic, there can be due to the connections between the different neurons, also can be intrinsic to the neurons. There are these channels that allow for ions to go in and out the cell and then can make a cell more electrically active or not. So since these neurons were firing more, the main hypothesis was that either we have an increased accelerator, some accelerator now is to make these cells fire, or maybe we have the release of a brain, like a break is not working. One of the main breaks of activity in the brain is our potassium channels, which they allow for potassium to come from inside the cell to the outside, and then they stop the activity of the neurons. And we figured out that this potassium channel that's called KCNQ was not working properly. So then the next question was, okay, these channels don't work properly and the neurons fire more, which could support why we hear a sound when, we, when, we don't, when there is not an external stimulus. And we figured out that the channels are there, they're in the memory, they're intact, but they don't open and close in the right time. You have to apply more force to them to open. These channels are voltage gated, which means that you can imagine that the voltage of the membrane is the force that you need to apply to the channel to open and close. So we found that these channels don't open when they're supposed to open and that's why this break is gone and that's why these neurons are more, uh, more excitable. But the good thing is that the channels are there. So we don't have to create this new channel. To, in order to help the channel, we don't have to create this new channel. We don't have to create new channels. We just have to open the pre-existing channels. So then this, uh, the collaboration started with Dr. Peter Wiff, who's a, who is a medicinal chemist. And because we knew the structure of the channel, we wanted to create a small molecule that we keep the channel open. And then the question is, if we keep the channel open, can we make the cells more quiet? And more importantly, can we remove, thin, can, if we give this thing, if we give this small molecule to mice, can we prevent them from having tinnitus? So at the time there was a drug in the market that's uh, called uh, retigabin that has been removed now. This was an opener of these channels. Basically it's a small molecule that opens these channels. And we figured out that this was working in mice both in quieting cells down and, and in stopping tinnitus. But this drug was removed from the market because uh, it, was, there was a, it was associated with a lot of toxicity and epileptics, uh, uh, individuals with problems with epilepsy were taking this drug successfully, but it was removed from the market. And that's why Peter Wiff created a new drug which is more potent and more specific and does not have the side effects that uh, retigabin had. So now we've, we've, done, we've gone through several rounds through 2017 to improve these, uh, these compounds and make them more specific and more potent. And currently we're uh, into preclinical development, meaning we're doing all these tests that we have to do before this drug is being given to humans and testing to see if it works. So we are well ahead in this preclinical development and uh, I'm happy also to announce that uh, UPMC Enterprise, which is the U University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and Medical Center and Enterprises, have endorsed our project. And we have a team that is looking both, because we're going towards the commercialization of, of this potential drug. We have a multidisciplinary team that's doing all the preclinical development, all the market analysis, and uh, everything else. So we're hoping that in the next year or two, and these are all go, no go tests. And for example, to give you an example of this go no go test, we know that the main toxicity of uh, retigabin, the previous FDA approved drug, is that it, it gave, uh, unfortunately gave people blue coloration in the skin and the retina. But we know that happen why that happens now, we're trying to de-risk that, right? We, we're doing all the tests to see that our compound, which was created in order not to have this effect, that it really doesn't have this effect. So these are all these go no go tests, and we hope that soon, We'll get FDA approval to start in human. So I'm going to stop here. And this is, as I said, this is a project that's been going on for more than 10, 11 years. And I'll pass it on to Dr. Williamson, who's going to tell us more about different, how different brain states affect our, uh, our perception of sound. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Um, just give me two seconds, I will share my screen. There we go. Okay, um, so I wanted to 
to kind of give everyone a bit of a, a whistle-stop tour of the, the, the auditory system, the, the auditory brain. And what I'm showing on the left here, um, this is a kind of simplified schematic of, of what's known as the ascending auditory system. So briefly, this is essentially how we hear. So sound first comes into our ears as a kind of acoustic physical signal. It's transduced in the cochlea, um, and the cochlea is really responsible for trans, um, for transducing the sound and converting it into, into an electrical signal. Um, and as Thanos mentioned, this electrical signal is, is the currency of neurons. So once, once this electrical signal leaves the cochlea, it's sent through multiple synapses throughout this ascending auditory hierarchy, um, working its way up to um, a brain area known as the, the auditory cortex. Um, and the auditory cortex is typically thought of as being a, a brain area that is that is crucial for for perception um, and, and understanding how we perceive the world um, and something that's really really neat about the auditory system is that is that neurons that are really really close to the cochlea um, so neurons in some of these subcortical auditory nuclei they're kind of equipped with the, the, the biophysical and synaptic specializations that, that are capable of supporting a really, really high fidelity encoding of, of the acoustic waveform. So what I mean by that is that this is really a case of what you hear is what you get when, when you directly compare sound um, to the neural responses that the sound elicits. So on the right hand side here, I'm showing uh, an example of a pure tone stimulus um, on the top. This is just a, a sine wave. And this sine wave um, is being amplitude modulated. So, so the amplitude of the sine wave is varying. And on the bottom right, you can see um, these, are, these are the electric discharge patterns coming from a neuron in, in the auditory nerve, which is essentially the highway from the, the cochlea to the cochlear nucleus. And the main thing to take away from this is that the firing patterns of these neurons are, can be directly mapped to the acoustic properties of the stimulus. So you have this really, really um, fine, faithful representation of the incoming sound. Now, if we jump all the way up to the level of the auditory cortex, this completely disappears. So we can no longer find neurons at the level of the auditory cortex that are this temporally precise. Cortical sound representations are typically thought of as being kind of rate-based abstractions of the, the incoming source signal. And on the right-hand side here, I'm showing just an example of this. This is a, a raster plot. Um, and what we're doing here is playing sounds with different repetition rates, essentially. And the key take home here is that there is no obvious structure in, in the spiking output of these neurons. Because what we've got is this transition from a faithful representation of acoustic fluctuation to this real abstract rate code um, at the level of the auditory cortex. Okay, so the next important question is why? Why do these neural responses at the level of the auditory cortex not actually reflect the, the true incoming sensory stimulus. So before I answer that question, I, I want to show you this video of a cat. Um, I want you to try and focus on the, the cat's pupils. Now, as it's sitting on the bed quietly here, its pupils are somewhat small and constricted. Now, if I start this video running, what you're going to see is someone blowing bubbles into this cat's face. Um, and I hope you can appreciate that as the cat starts to see these bubbles, as he starts to attend to them, as he starts to move his head around to, to, to visualize what's in front of him, the cat's pupil diameter is directly changing as he changes his focus on, on, on the bubbles. Now, from a biological perspective, this is actually really interesting because pupil diameter um, is, is a, actually a direct readout of um, certain neuromodulatory systems within the brain. Um, and what you can kind of appreciate from this video is that pupil diameter is directly related to, to something that I, I like to refer to as the behavioral state of the animal. So what I mean by that is that pupil diameter correlates with um, numerous different behavioral attributes. So things like attention, arousal, emotion um, can be related indirectly to pupil diameter. And here, this is just a simple example that as the cat attends to the bubbles, his cognitive load increases, and this leads to an increase in pupil diameter. And I mention all this because behavioral state is one of the kind of key reasons why sound is not accurately represented in the auditory cortex. 
Um, and what I'm showing in this figure, which I'll go through in a second, is that pupil diameter is actually directly correlated with changes in the firing properties of cortical neurons. So in this example on the right-hand side, um, I'm plotting pupil diameter in orange, and you can see that this pupil diameter is kind of fluctuating um, as a function of time. Um, the blue box is showing a, a region where the pupil diameter is increasing and then it gradually decreases again. And on the bottom, I'm showing again the electrical discharge patterns of a neuron in the auditory cortex. Um, but what we're doing is we're presenting this neuron with, with sound. Um, and, the sound and the sound is um, highlighted in the, in, in the grey boxes. So we're playing repeated noise bursts. And the key thing to take away from this is that as the pupil diameter gradually increases, you can see that the neural representation to sound in this case is actually increasing. So the behavioral state of the animal actually has this remarkable ability to alter the way in which neurons fire and the way in which stimuli are represented in the brain. Okay, so I've shown you the cortical neurons are modulated by the behavioral state of the animal. And I've already focused on the, the, the ascending auditory system where the cochlea transduces sound, converts it to electrical signal and, and processes this all the way up to the level of the auditory cortex. But the situation is actually a little bit more complicated than this because cortical neurons communicate and transmit sensory information to a whole host of different brain areas. And this is typically known as the, the descending auditory system or the cortical fugal auditory system. And what's really, really cool about this is that some of these brain areas that the, the cortex communicates with are auditory, but some are non-auditory. So what I mean by this is that the cortex will send auditory information encoded in the electrical fluctuations of neurons, it will send that information either back down the ascending hierarchy so that you have these elaborate recurrent feedback loops where auditory information is sent to auditory stations. But auditory information is also transmitted to several key hubs of the brain that are typically not thought of as being auditory. And some of these are, are heavily involved in, in emotional processing. So the example I'm giving here is the amygdala. The amygdala is, is a huge emotional hub of, in, in, within the brain. Um, the striatum is another example. The striatum is, is a hub of the brain that's involved in, in, the, in the reward circuitry of the brain and it's involved in decision making and converting information, sensory information to motor action. So as you might imagine, this kind of has direct translational importance. So to, to kind of piggyback on what Thanos mentioned earlier, we have the situation where auditory responses in the cortex are modulated by behavioral state and this modulated information is being relayed to key parts of the brain that regulate emotion. So if we consider something like an auditory ailment, so something like tinnitus or hyperacusis that directly affects these cells, then this is a, a circuit mechanism in the brain that can lead to the development of emotional symptoms. So it might be the case that if we consider something like the heterogeneity that we see in tinnitus sufferers, looking at and studying the organization of this connectivity might lead to insight as to why this heterogeneity actually exists. Now, what makes this a particularly exciting problem for, for a neuroscientist like myself is that we now actually have the tools and technologies that allow us the ability to, to directly monitor and manipulate thousands of neurons simultaneously in awake behaving animals. Um, so on the right here, I'm actually showing you some data which we recorded from my lab. Um, we utilize something known as a cranial window preparation. Uh, this preparation essentially involves replacing the skull, or at least parts of the skull, with glass. Um, so this generates a window to the brain, so to speak. Um, and by doing this, um, we can then use a, a state-of-the-art two-photon microscope to essentially look through this window and watch thousands of cells in real time. It's pretty magical. And what you can see on the right here in this video, it looks like the twinkling stars in the sky, but this is actually about three millimeters squared of the auditory cortex of an awake behaving mouse. And the little twinkling stars are the electrical discharge patterns of real live neurons. Um, and at the same time, um, on the left, I'm showing you some high-speed videography. So while we're recording the activity of thousands of neurons, we can use a high frame rate video camera 
to monitor um, the facial movements of, of a mouse. And we can use um, statistical tracking algorithms to track different parts of that image. So in this video on the left, what you can see I'm doing is I'm, I'm fitting um, ellipsoids to both the, the, the pupil so that we can get a readout of pupil diameter, um, the eyelid. Um, and we're also tracking movements of the animal's nose, of the animal's ear. So these, these, this just leaves us with a, a number of different behavioral variables that then we can subsequently correlate with the, the neural responses that we record. Okay, so just to finish, I, I, I want to kind of really emphasize that this, this, these problems of, of, of circuitry and connectivity really do have direct clinical, clinical and translational relevance. So as we know, there, there are a multitude of different disorders of perception, um, from things like tinnitus and, and even schizophrenia. Both of these involve the perception of sounds that don't exist. And even other disorders, things like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, this involves the irrepressible awareness of, of unwanted or distracting sounds. But the key take home that I've been trying to convey is that we hear what the brain tells us to hear. And, and this really does raise some particularly important translational opportunities. I mean, this kind of basic science that I've described to you, um, it, it studies how neural circuits of the brain are, are organized and how neural circuits of the brain function. And to put it simply, we need to know this in order to understand what happens when these circuits break. And as a result of this, this kind of research could really lead to insights as to kind of what are the correct neural circuits that we need to target for therapeutic benefit? Do we need to focus on cortical signals that are transmitted to the amygdala in order to understand the emotional symptoms that are present in tinnitus sufferers, for example? And of course, the brain is also highly plastic. So we can utilize techniques to, to perhaps reinforce healthy patterns of activity in the awake brain in order to repair the function of damaged neural circuits. So I think with that, I will, I will finish there and I'm happy to answer any questions that, that you guys might have. Okay, thank you to both presenters. Um, that is a lot of very, very interesting information. Uh, we are getting questions. So I'll tell the, uh, the attendees of today's webinar that um, you again can type questions through the question and answer bubble that is at the bottom of your screen. I also have the list of attendees open so that I can see the um, hand raising mechanism as well. If you'd like to raise your hand, I can uh, then uh, be able to see if it, we'll be able to unmute you when I call on you and, uh, and you'll be able to answer your question directly. So let me start with the questions we have on the board. Um, so uh, first question uh, I could tell you is for Dr. Zanopoulos. It is uh, when are clinical trials expected to start? Now let's unmute Dr. Zanopoulos and get him back up here on the screen. Sorry. Thanos, you're back live and let's get your video back up too. Okay, I'm okay. here. Um, so the question is when, when clinical trials are expected to start? It, to start? No. Yes. Okay. Um, we have started the preclinical development of, uh, of the compound, which uh, a lot of it is toxicology studies and pharmacokinetic studies and trying to deal with the problems that retigabin has. So what I can tell you is that we expect that within a year or so from now, we, sh we must have de risk all the things that uh, are associated with the toxicity of retigabin. Keep in mind that all these are go, no go tests. So far, our tests have been go. Go means, okay, it passes the next, so we continue. No go means something very toxic that we have to reconsider the strategy. So I expect that in a year, year and a half, we should be able to, to complete the preclinical development then moving to clinical trials. Okay, thank you. All right, the next question is, um, and I, I, uh, the panel can determine who should answer this, is RL81 supposed to help pain from hyperacusis? Dr. Palmer, we should unmute you too, just to make sure you're available. Um, okay, the question RL81 for people that might not know is uh, so far the leading compound that we have for opening these channels that, uh, that I described to you earlier, right? Um, this, co this compound is supposed to reduce the excitability of, uh, of neurons. So in theory, it could potentially help uh, 
hyperacusis, but it's a stretch. I, I do not, I'm not sure, but in theory, it could. I don't know, Catherine, Dr. Palm, would you like to add anything? Well, I, I leave the chemistry of that to <laughs> you. I mean, right now, our, you know, our best, um, bet on helping with people with hyperacusis. So for the group, that's, you know, an intolerance of louder sounds that would be very tolerable um, to most people. And it's not specific sound, it's just about level. Um, we certainly can help people with that um, in the clinic. We, we have a program they can go through to help them to slowly acclimate and, and, and tolerate um, more sound, which is important because we, we really live in a very loud kind of noisy world. So we can help people with that. Um, but I think the question is really insightful using the word pain, um, because I think that's really what people are experiencing. Um, so I, but I leave it to, um, to Thanos to really talk about the, the chemistry, you know, whether that'll have an impact or not. Okay. In theory, it could, and we're going to test when we have the clinical trials, there's going to be also, uh, individual hyperacusis and that would hopefully be tested. That, mm -hmm. That's all I can say for now. Okay. Um, I think this, this is a, a continued question on RL81. When will RL81 hit the market and will you, uh, will you do this in Europe? Uh, uh, so. I don't know when it's going to hit the market. Uh, I repeat before we expect in about a year, year and a half to finish the preclinical development, the de-risking of the compound. Then after that, we'll start phase one, et cetera. So I unfortunately, I cannot give a, I cannot be more specific. Okay. okay. And then what else did you ask me if, the, if it's going to be in Europe? For some reason, I, the team that I'm collaborating with, the, the initial clinical trials might occur in Australia. Somehow things are easier, more uh, beneficial for, uh, for, our, for what we're trying to do. However, I do not know exactly why. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, the next question, a lot of good chemistry questions here. Do you think the K channel mechanism applies to the tinnitus that often accompanies hyperacusis? That tinnitus sometimes shows up as reactive, example to sound, not necessarily chronic. I think that's similar to the question before, right? Would it help? Um, it could, and, but, and also mechanistically, both tinnitus and hyperacusis are associated with a, with a decrease in, with a hearing loss, some sort of hearing loss, and an increased responsiveness of the, the auditory system. Uh, however, there are things that are different between hyperacusis and tinnitus. I guess that's all I can say. There are some similarities, but there also there are some difference between the two, between the two disorders. And uh, Dr. Palmer? Well, yes, I think part of what they're asking, and, and this is something I, I know you think a lot about, is the, just the heterogeneity of tinnitus. Oh. Um, and, and so I think what they're talking about here is there's chronic tinnitus where they're just experiencing tinnitus. They experience it all the time. It might sometimes get worse or better. And then some people experience tinnitus really react reacting to sound. So when there is more sound around them or louder sounds, they're, they're going to have perception. I think that's what the question may have been um, speaking towards. So I think the question is your, um, the pathway of treatment that you're exploring is, mm -hmm. the, is the expectation that it would help with many different types of tinnitus, maybe that are brought on by different things or, or more targeted, targeted by certain, mm. you know, types of tinnitus. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Um, we think there are multiple types of tinnitus, but this is not clear yet what defines each, so what it's tinnitus in terms of mechanism. However, at least we can say that there are how different things are being induced, right? How, how do we get into this? And then the, the mechanism that I described to you uh, a few minutes ago, I will have to do with the noise induced tinnitus and with tinnitus that mice are exposed to loud sound, they lose hearing, some hearing that triggers all these other mechanisms that end up leading to tinnitus. So for our clinical trials, probably what we're thinking what's going to happen, we'd like to do, we'd like to initially enroll people that have had tinnitus for six months and then start testing it there and then hopefully get some positive feedback and then expand the, the time, the time within which individuals had tinnitus and expand the trial. Okay. 
Thank you. You know, and, and I see a few of these questions we've already answered here. So I'm going to go to a, uh, uh, another one here. That's it's actually from someone we, we all know, Dr. Jeff Gross. Um, are there uh, regenerative approaches that are being developed to treat the various forms of hearing loss? Um, okay, maybe I'll start on that and others can fill up. So you're right. Today, the seminar or the webinar was most, mostly on brain mechanisms, right? But we hear also with our ears and uh, the main problem of hearing loss is the disconnection, the disconnect between the ear and the brain, right? This, when this connection, this, this connection is lost, that leads to hearing loss and subsequently hyperacusis, tinnitus and other hearing related disorders. So another aspect we're trying to do, and maybe we should have another webinar on that is that uh, trying to see how we can uh, uh, regenerate the auditory nerve and basically how can we reconnect the ear to the brain? Because again, in theory, right? If we, if we restore the input that the brain gets, we're probably going to help the brain making again the right prediction and using the fundal perceptions in a beneficial and not in a in a pathological manner so we're currently actually trying to hire new people that uh, <clears throat> will address this type of questions how to regenerate the auditory nerve and certainly something that we're very interested about okay thank you all right um going through more questions here and they're, they're coming in and I don't see anybody who's raised their hand yet. So we'll keep doing the reading of these questions. Um, I'm trying to learn a foreign language and suffer from tinnitus and hearing loss. Aside from obvious issues of mishearing words, do these problems affect my ability to learn a new language? Dr. Palmer? <laughs> well, you know, um, it's, a, it's a great question. And you know what it makes me think about Thanos, I, I don't know that I can just give you a for sure answer. But it really makes me think about the work we're doing with our CMU colleagues in attention. Um, because when you think of learning, you need to be able to attend and focus. And I think Ross can comment on this because he, he was just talking about, um, you know, with the pupillometry and looking at attention and behavior. Um, so if these things are consuming you or distracting you, um, one would absolutely expect an impact on learning. But let me pass it off to Ross, because I'm sure he'll have more to say on that. Yeah, I mean, the kind of take home is that neurons respond to other neurons. So if, if you have some kind of peripheral insult, which percolates all the way up to the auditory cortex, everything on the way to the level of the auditory cortex has the possibility of getting changed. The auditory cortex integrates inputs coming from lots and lots of different areas. Um, so all of these um, kind of peripheral, th this peripheral insult has a way of kind of filtering through to a whole bunch of different brain areas. And if, if the behavioral state is, is altered, um, then that's going to modulate the way in which sensory information is transferred throughout the brain. So that could have direct effects on, on, on learning, on, on plasticity, on the way in which you direct your attention. It's going to have a direct effect on the way in which you elicit an emotional reaction to sound. Um, all of the brain areas that, 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 that actually mitigate all of these, that, that, that actually um, are involved in, in, in all of these different things are, are wired up. So yeah. But with that said, there's no downside to learning a new language, so go for it, even if it's a little bit harder. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I must, if it, if it does relate to tinnitus, I, I must have lots of problems with that because I cannot learn languages very well at all. <laughs> um, so uh, having reduced potassium in one's body due to IC conditions, would that have a, per, uh, a, a productive effect on the potassium channel you're speaking of? Reducing potassium con uh, concentration due to what? I'm sorry. Uh, I see. What is I see? Um, that I don't know. I see conditions. Maybe. Uh, I don't know either. If any, does any maybe digestive or other conditions. I, I see to me means inferior colliculus. So they yeah, better okay. they better type out what it means. Yeah, I I'll wait for that. But uh, I think yeah. in general, the the correlation would be: is there a correlation between low potassium in your body and um, and the channels that you're speaking of. 
I think low potassium in the body is, uh, is bad news, right? The, the, you need to have a, a specific concentration for things to, to happen normally in your body. So I would not recommend, and I'll ask Dr. Palmer to say more on it, I would not recommend somebody changing his or her potassium concentration because that affects so, so many things um, in the brain. However, in the test tube, in, uh, in experiments, yes, you can change that you can change how it, it's a potassium channel works based on the concentration you're going to put inside and outside the, the cell. But yeah. I don't see that as a, as a potential therapy. And, and you're affecting specific cells with the, the molecules that you're using, such as the one that you're developing, you're, you're affecting specific cells in those potassium channels, mm. which is No, not than... really. I'm affecting all the cells that express this potassium channel. Does that make sense? It's not I can target cells. This, this drug, this compound targets this specific the channel. specific might, channels. Which okay. are expressed in various neurons, not just in one type of neuron. So okay. the specificity comes from the, the molecule that they target and not the cell. All right. Part um, of, um, I would just say part of what Thanos was mentioning, I think is a, a, a great overall concept that just good, good health is a good thing. You know, so your, your general health, whether you're talking about tinnitus or hypoacusis or hearing, um, it's, it's always wise to take care of your general health because that will have an impact on all of these things and including attention that we were just speaking about. Okay. Another question here. Will the RL81 drug have to be taken for life of the patient in order to cure or reduce tinnitus? Or will it work with just a specific set of doses? Um, this is part of the preclinical development and the dosage. What I can say, though, from things that are not published, even after the noise, exp you expose mice to loud sound, right, to give them tinnitus. And then even if we give the drug a week later, RL81, the drug is to mice, one week after the noise exposure, and then we track tinnitus for four weeks. Uh, if we give the drug just for two days, twice, twice a day for two days, in mice, it works to prevent tinnitus that, that expressed four weeks later. More of this type of studies are currently ongoing, and it's part of the preclinical development, as I said. So we go, when we go to human uh, trials, to clinical trials will have more information as to how long it should be given. But I don't expect it to be taken every single time. Okay. It should be a critical window that we have not fully de de uh, determined yet, that when you take it, it can prevent the, the development of the disorder. Okay, uh, here's a question. Um, in your opinion, is most tinnitus due to cochlear damage or is there some tinnitus that can originate in the brain and will your compound be able to address both? Um, okay, I'll give my opinion and I'll pass it to Catherine and Ross. My opinion is yes, I think in the vast majority of cases, there is some form, some form of hearing loss. And um, also generally speaking, I think our minds and brains don't get old. It's usually that our body gets first old. I don't know, I used to play soccer when I was until 18, 19, that's all my, that was all my life. In my brain, I still have it. I think I can jump where I used to, I can defend the way. My brain has it, but my body doesn't have it yet. So my muscles don't do it. My sensory systems are not as good. So yes, I do believe that for the vast majority of cases, it's a peripheral d damage that occurs mm -hmm. through noise or through aging or through other uh, processes. And then that leads to to the confusion of the brain slash mind. Now, the drug that will be <clears throat> could help mostly the central. So I don't know, what do you think, Catherine and Ross? I mean, I, I can't really speak too much to the compound, but I mean, with regards to the question of can tinnitus originate in the brain? I don't know. I actually think I'm, I'm more inclined to say that it might not necessarily just be due to cochlear damage in the sense that I mean, like, like you described earlier, if you have some kind of peripheral insult, it leads to this reorganization of, of excitation and inhibition in the brain that leads to an overall um, hyper-excitativity hyper -excitativity, um, signal. But th there have been some great studies that show that you can essentially, by artificially turning on neurons at different brain stations, you can 
I mean, we used to call it hearing the light. So, I mean, there's, there's an incredible um, um, technique out there known as optogenetics for those that, that aren't familiar with it. This is, this is a, a means where you can control the firing patterns of neurons with, with light. Now, if you train an animal to do uh, some kind of behavioral task in response to sound, you can train up the animal so that they reliably um, behave in response to sound. If you then take sound away and replace sound with, with light, they can still perform the behavior. So by manipulating certain neurons, you, you can get animals to respond. So all that to say that, that the brain is incredibly plastic. And, and if some kind of reorganization due to some form of plasticity or learning occurs in, in potentially a maladaptive way, it could lead to the perception of sounds that don't exist. I mean, in the same way I, I mentioned earlier in my, my presentation that schizophrenia also involves the perception of sound that doesn't exist, um, where people hear voices. That is unlikely to be due to cochlear damage, but it may be that the same circuit mechanisms in the brain are, are somehow involved. How do we know that there is not a sensory deficit in schizophrenia, in individual schizophrenia? Are you asking how do we know whether or how not do we know that there is not a sensory deficit in them prior to? I don't know of any research that. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't either. Yeah. You know, it's a it's an interesting question because we've been interacting with our colleagues that that work with Thanos as well with schizophrenia, and um, they have a tendency um, in their studies to screen hearing and not really measure it carefully. So we've been kind of asking some of the same questions and teaming up with them that it would be interesting to have more careful auditory measures with that same group of people, um, and I think that speaks to a little bit of where we. I think audiology, you know, there's, there's a, a new horizon for us as well in terms of how careful we can measure things to see where maybe there's been disruption and our, our general audiological measures haven't shown it in the past. So there's, I think, some pretty exciting work in this area um, for both what Thanos and Ross were talking about. But it's all a disruption somewhere. Something's been disrupted, <laughs> whether it's through trauma or, you know, some something's been disrupted. Yeah. Well, I... Thank you. And you know what? We're getting a, a lot of questions. And um, I'll just tell all of our attendees that uh, we, we, uh, what the way we manage our time here as far as being able to address all the questions um, on air is, uh, you know, what we'll do is whatever we do not finish answering. So if you've typed in a question, we will, we have your email. So we will uh, answer those questions via email. So uh, I apologize if I didn't get to yours, but I'm going to finish the question and answer session with one last question because it's on here. And I think it's probably what uh, most uh, people out there who are listening in, uh, particularly on the topic of tinnitus want to know, uh, do you think a cure could be possible one day? Yes. <laughs> a simple answer. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's obviously yeah. what everybody's working for. And, and I, I can assure you that, you know, I, I've been um, with the Ioneer Foundation for 10 years and working with uh, Dr. Zanopoulos, Dr. Palmer and the team and, and Dr. Williamson, who's just uh, one of the newer members. But the, um, but the focus is, is specifically on just that, trying to find a treatment for people who've been suffering with tinnitus. And, and it's something that the team has worked very, very hard on. And, you know, we've been happy to support and proud to support and we've done that thanks to many very generous people who've, who've been supporting um, the work at the Ioneer Foundation. So, um, okay, we are, um, you know, towards the end of the hour. Again, there are lots of questions and you can keep them coming. You can send the emails to um, uh, Craig Smith, who's, whose email you have in your invitation list. And all of these other questions we will send to our panelists. So if they, uh, they'll have a, a chance to, to answer for you. And um, I want to thank all of the panelists today and thank all of the attendees. It's been a really wonderful session. This is, again, the second time we've done this. As you'll notice, because we do both vision and hearing and lots of other topics related to ear, nose, and throat, what we're going to do is do a topic uh, that goes back and forth between what we're doing in the vision science and then on the ear, nose, and throat science each week or each, each session. These are biweekly. So uh, the next topic, uh, which will be in two weeks, will be on glaucoma. So we will uh, send out information related to that soon. And um, 
and again, welcome and thank you very much and, and look forward to continuing to get to answer your questions, but also look forward to future webinars and, uh, and please give us your feedback as we send a survey out tomorrow. And uh, we'll, all, we'll all thank uh, technology for, for being on our, in our favor today. It actually worked fairly well. <laughs> and we'll, uh, again, look forward to, to seeing everybody again. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.